I knew I had to go back to work because I was the only anthropologist. And I knew that was going to play a role in the identification. So on the 13th, I went back. And then the city was so weird. There were just flags everywhere, and it was empty. And, and it was like people knew, like old women would walk by me and just like touch me on the shoulder and be like, God bless you. You know, like it was so weird. And then I got into work, and the first thing I did was go in to see the chief, because he had been there during the collapse, and I didn't know if he was even alive. And when I walked in his office, um, he looked at me, and he stood up, and he had tears in his eyes. And, and he looked at like my face, which was a mess, and he said, you look so beautiful. And I knew what he meant. He meant, I'm glad you're alive. And then I just started working. Because I wasn't ready to think about it or deal with it or talk about it or anything. And so we worked 12 hour days, seven days a week. Everyone was looking for someone that they knew. It's a really, the, the police and the fire department's a really tight knit group. So they all had a brother, or a father, or a cousin, you know, who died. So when we worked together at the table, when someone recognizable would be on the table um, and, and one of the workers had a hard time, we all stopped together and we all took a break together. And it made it a lot easier knowing that, you know, I was working with people who kind of got it. So for about a year straight, you were mm -hmm. identifying victims? Well, that, that was, we weren't even, I mean, we were identifying them, but for the most part, we were receiving them and documenting them and cataloging them and 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 you know doing the the initial mortuary work before we could even get to the identifications because you know if if there's not a hand to fingerprint if there's not a a portion of the head with teeth then we've got DNA so we had you know just about 20,000 fragments and about 5,000 of them were 1 inch or smaller so those have to be identified by DNA. There's no other mechanism. Is what point, I mean, do you not identify them? Well, disasters come in two different forms. There's an open population and a closed population. So a closed population is like a plane crash. You know who died. And once you have 100% of the victims identified, you don't necessarily have to identify 100% of the fragments. The World Trade Center was an open population. We didn't know who was there. And because the fragmentation was so extreme and because there were fires that burned for three months, which will, you know, a commercial cremation is like eight hours, you know, so these fires burned for three months. We knew people might be completely consumed. And so we decided that we would test every piece because that piece that's this big might be the only piece there is of someone. And indeed, that was not uncommon. So usually there's a cutoff on what you would send for DNA testing. Um, but we didn't have one for this project. So what's the longest families were waiting and, and actually received remains? The, there was just a new identification like a week ago. They're still doing it. We didn't have a plan. A, for DNA for a mass disaster. I mean, we had a plan for plane crashes, and we had plans for subway crashes, and but we didn't have anything for something of this magnitude. Um, so we were kind of winging it and, you know, making it up as we were going along. And I mean, we made a lot of mistakes, but we also learned from them and changed what we were doing to reflect what we were learning along the way.